So new digital frontiers, which is the, the theme for this short series of digital shift, uh, is intended to explore the role that AI and machine learning can play in our libraries, the platforms that we use, the challenges we face and the opportunities which we have. And there's currently a lot of interest in libraries regarding the use of AI. Much of this enthusiasm comes from the increasing capabilities of generative AI systems. And vendors are increasingly offering AI-enabled products and services, uh, and, uh, and people across all sectors and industries are eager to do something with AI. In today's discussion, Daniel Van Strien will explore practical ways in which libraries can leverage AI and machine learning and why this doesn't often doesn't necessarily necessitate the use of generative AI. Daniel will also advocate for more libraries to consider adopting and contributing to open source AI. So a little bit about Daniel. Daniel Van Strien is a machine learning librarian at Hugging Face, which is a startup focused on democratizing good machine learning. And before joining Hugging Face, Daniel was a digital curator for the Living with Machines project at the British Library. Daniel has a strong interest in the role AI can play in libraries and how libraries and concepts from library science can contribute to creating a healthier machine learning ecosystem. So very warm welcome, Daniel, and I'm going to hand over to you and stop sharing. Um, so I'll dive right in. My goal is to talk for about 40 minutes and then leave plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. Um, but as the kind of blur for the, the talk hinted at, the, the main kind of argument or point I want to get across in this session um, is to both talk about open source AI and machine learning and what that is. Uh, and why I think that that can resonate better with some of the values that libraries have and has some other advantages for libraries versus proprietary systems. Um, but also kind of take a little bit of a step back in how people approach machine learning as something that can be used um, in libraries. Um, so as I kind of said in the blurb, there's a huge amount of interest in generative AI and because of that, there's a, a kind of big shift to consider a lot of problems framed around generative AI. Um, but I think it's quite useful to take a step back and look at some other approaches that, that might be more suitable um, in the library setting. And I guess my overall um, kind of grandiose claim with this talk is that there's kind of two uh, futures for the use of AI and machine learning in the library sector. So one is that all AI is mediated through um, kind of proprietary platforms and behind closed systems. And often those systems will be at the back end calling one or two large models provided by a few large companies. And I think there's another future in which people are using a lot more small task specific models and there's a rich ecosystem of people kind of developing and contributing to those models and the tools around them. So I guess the, the talk is slightly aspirational in trying to uh, present the second future as a kind of more desirable one. So I'll just give a, a little bit more of a background. Um, so I'm a machine learning librarian at Hugging Face, um, but my background is really um, working in libraries. So, so as I already mentioned, I used to work at the British Library, um, but before that I worked at UCL and before that I worked in hospital libraries. So um, my background is really as a librarian and I kind of learned some of the computer science and programming stuff as I kind of uh, went through my career. But I still kind of identify very strongly as a librarian and kind of feel very um, close to that sector. Um, so yeah, I'll jump straight into the talk um, and the, the kind of first thing I will talk about is what Hugging Face is. So this will come up throughout the talk and I'll kind of delve into more depth of what some of these things are. But if you haven't come across Hugging Face before, um, we're a company that aims to democratize good machine learning. We can talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, but there's a few main ways in which we practically try and do that. So one of these is by providing something called the Hugging Face Hub. So this is a kind of central platform where people can share models, data sets, and machine learning demos. 
and people are then able to reuse those machine learning models and build on top of them. So if you're familiar with GitHub, uh, it's a very kind of similar idea in terms of providing a platform for people to build on top of each other's work. Um, another component is this open science element. So I think open science is something that a lot of people working in libraries will be very familiar with and will be supporting. Um, and Hugging Face has been involved in an, uh, a number of open science initiatives. So two I've mentioned here are a project uh, called Big Science, and this took place a couple of years ago. And the goal of that project was to train a large language model in the open uh, as part of a very big international collaboration with people from different disciplines working together to kind of create that model, the data sets, the documentation around the model. Um, and another one is Big Code, which is a kind of similar effort, but focused on coding models that help uh, help people write code. Um, and I guess the, the underlying goal of these projects is to kind of demonstrate different ways of developing um, models and doing that in the open. And the third kind of pillar is uh, by providing open source tools and frameworks. Um, so I won't talk so much about these today, but there's a number of Python libraries that are very heavily used. Uh, so there's one called Transformers. And the idea with these libraries is that they make it very easy for developers to leverage state-of-the-art machine learning models without having to do a lot of work to kind of implement those models themselves. So often in a couple of lines of code, you can use a very powerful model um, in, your, in your kind of code. So kind of turning to the topic of how libraries can leverage machine learning. So I guess the, the first thing I would say with this proprietary um, kind of model uh, thing that I've mentioned is that there's going to be a lot of this kind of um, generative AI that is going to become part of universities and libraries. So I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, I think that's something that's happening. So things like co-pilot licenses for institutions, library vendors providing um, AI solutions as part of their library management systems, and kind of tools aimed at academia. Um, so all of these things are, are going to kind of emerge, and I think some of them could be very useful tools. But I guess what I want to argue for today is that there's also a lot of other opportunities besides these kind of uh, solutions. Um, so kind of stepping back to actually using uh, proprietary generative AI to kind of leverage machine learning. For something in a kind of library setting, we could imagine having a kind of task that we want to use a machine learning model for to help us with a kind of core day-to-day -day library task. Um, so one of those would be generating metadata. So here, uh, the example is focused on generating metadata based on the title and abstract of a paper. And if you kind of type this prompt and put in the title and the abstract to uh, a model like ChatGPT or Claude, you're going to get back uh, some kind of answer and it's going to be fairly uh, happy to kind of comply with that request. Um, but the thing that I want to kind of point out already with a system like that is you get back some keywords um, in this metadata and depending on what your use case is and what kind of library you're working in, these keywords might be very useful or completely useless. So this example, um, this paper is related to agriculture. If you work in a specialized library focusing on agricultural um, resources, then something with the tag uh, agriculture is not gonna be very useful. So I guess that's the first point I wanna make about some of these proprietary models is that they can be very good in general, but when you wanna be more specific in the kind of task that you're doing or the type of data you're working with, they can start to, to become less useful. Um, and to kind of take a little bit of a step back to look at how large language models uh, work, I have a typo here. Um, so I think most of you will be familiar with this concept, but the idea that large language models are basically doing next word prediction or next token prediction. So you have a sentence like the cats are on, and then you want to predict the next word after the. So you 
probably expect something like the CATSAT on the map. But the thing with uh, a large language model is that essentially it's predicting probabilities for every kind of word or token in its vocabulary. So it basically has for uh, this kind of sentence to predict the probability of every word that that language model knows about. And then you kind of usually get one that will have a higher probability. But the point I kind of want to make here is that underneath these kind of fairly um, uh, complex systems and interfaces, underneath you have something that essentially is trying to predict uh, the next word in the sentence. And that's not to say that that can't be useful, but that's the kind of underlying technology that systems like ChatGPT actually have to rely on. So I guess then the next question is, where do these probabilities come from? And again, I think probably most of you are familiar that a lot of these probabilities come from text data scrapes from the internet. So most of the closed models do a very bad job of describing their data sets. So they will usually say something like, the model was trained on publicly available data, and that will be kind of the extent of the information. So there's been some interesting work, um, including this piece from uh, the Washington Post, that tries to look at um, one of the data sets that's sometimes used for training these large language model and look at the kind of breakdown of where that content is actually coming from. And that kind of work is something that we're very strongly advocating, um, that hugging face, as one potential approach for having a slightly better insight as to what these models are doing and what some of their biases and limitations might be. So I guess the, the limitations of this generative AI approach uh, three main ones I want to highlight here. Are, the first is that these models are kind of open-ended. So as the name generative implies, they're generative, so they can kind of generate new responses. And that means that they're kind of open-ended and they can say almost anything. So that can be really powerful and it can also be um, a problem. And that particularly can be an issue if we want to integrate outputs of these models into existing structured metadata or use them within existing workflows where we expect data to look like uh, be in a certain format uh, or look um, yeah look in some specific way and then I guess the the final one is this environmental and financial cost of running these models so um, these large language models underpinning systems like uh, GPT4 uh, chat GPT which is GPT4 and Claude uh, require a lot of compute to, to run, uh, and that comes with environmental cost. Um, so I guess uh, looking back at our example of uh, this metadata that's generated by um, a large language model, depending on what kind of format you're looking at, this could be very useful, but some of these uh, kind of fields might not be relevant. And there's a kind of challenge of getting that into a system and, and a format that you can actually ingest into your workflows. Um, so looking at the limitations of closed source, so not just generative AI, but closed source specifically. So I've already kind of hinted at the problematic data, but there's a few other issues that can come up. And these become much more of an issue if you're using these models in a kind of production workflow and a slightly less of a problem if you're just using them to help you write emails or things like that. Um, so one issue that comes up quite a lot is this idea of versioning the model. So you will often see discussions on Twitter or X um, about a model kind of getting worse at a particular task. So although the, the name of the model quite often will stay the same, often uh, providers of proprietary systems will subtly change the way a uh, model is uh, used under the hood, or they'll make subtle changes to the model. And that can mean that something that was working very well one week, the next week doesn't work very well at all. The other ones that I've kind of hinted at in relation to, to training data is this difficulty of understanding the potential harms and bias of these models, because you're not sure both what data they were trained on, but also um, what the kind of approach of training the model in general was. And then another one that can be a, an issue for universities and libraries is privacy concerns. Uh, 
So one way that a lot of institutions are getting around this is just paying more money to a provider to basically say that they're not going to use the data for uh, training models. Um, but that potentially can still be a concern for certain types of data. You might still want to have some slightly stronger assurances about where that data is even going and where the, the model is being run. And then I guess the final one that I think is particularly important is that these models are kind of gen generally focused. So they have a kind of broad um, focus on being useful for a lot of tasks, but that means that they can often not be good at a very specific task that you might be interested in. And that's what I'm going to kind of talk a little bit more about um, in the next section. So open source, in contrast to the kind of proprietary approach, is the uh, idea which is kind of developed out of um, open source software, but also open access and open science, that developments in science happen better in the open. So people share the results of what worked and didn't work. People can kind of more quickly build uh, new technologies that, that kind of work better. The other big ones, are this kind of idea of accessibility and inclusivity. So there are still difficulties, even if a model is made openly available and actually having the resources to run those models. But open uh, source AI has a kind of uh, possibility of being much more accessible to many more people, both in terms of being able to use those models, but also potentially being able to actually contribute um, to the models themselves. And then transparency and privacy. So with transparency, you have a much better idea usually of how the model was trained and what data it was trained on, although that's not always the case. And then privacy, if you're able to run the model on your own hardware, you have much more uh, control over where the data ends up, um, which might be important for some use cases. And then I guess the final one, which I think could be very important in this setting is that you can tailor how the model's gonna be used for a particular use case. So what are some other approaches to machine learning that don't rely on these generative models? So a very simple approach that some of you will probably already be familiar with is the idea of doing text classification. So going back to our title and abstract example, we can do something that's slightly different to using an LLM and instead pass it to a text classification model. And as the name implies, that model is supposed to classify a piece of text uh, into a few different categories or one uh, category out of a set of possible options. So in this case, we have a model that takes in a title and abstract for a paper, and then it assigns a label, describes a data set, but doesn't describe a new data set. And I guess the question you might have with an approach like that is, can you actually do anything useful? And I guess my argument is that that kind of approach where a model does something narrow, but does it very well and very cheaply can be incredibly useful. I think the challenge is thinking about how those kind of models can fit into existing workflows and where they might be uh, helpful for your work. So an example from my own uh, kind of day-to-day -day work, so I try and keep track of new data sets being released in machine learning research. Um, and if I use archive to find papers related to data sets, if I do a kind of keyword search for data sets and some other kind of related words, I get back a lot of papers that are about data sets, but don't introduce a new data set as such. And what I'm interested in is a paper where they say, hey, we've released this new data set. And I often want to kind of have a look at that data set and see what it's about. Um, so to help me with that, I basically train the model. And the way I did that is to provide a few examples of abstracts and titles where a new paper, uh, paper did introduce a new data set and examples where it didn't. And from that, I'm able to create this kind of simple dashboard for myself where every day I can kind of have a look and see new papers being released, which probably have new data sets described. And I think that kind of very simple text classification model can actually be quite useful in a lot of different library type settings. So simple example is assigning sentiment to chat messages. So if you're getting chat messages from your users, then the temptation might be to say, okay, let's build a bot that responds to them and helps them answer their questions. And that potentially could be a valid approach. 
But you might have cases where a user asks, what time is the library shut? And the bot is just like, oh, it shuts at 10 p.m. But that is kind of based on some probabilities in the training data rather than anything that relates to your actual library policy. So a kind of slightly more narrow way of tackling something like that would be to either assign some sentiment or some other label to these chat messages. And then you could either use that to direct people to a web page or to a particular staff member. Or you could do things like see whether the message is positive or negative to get a sense of how your users are kind of uh, feeling about your service overall. And similarly, you might do things like sorting um, some digitized documents into different categories. So those could be very broad categories or very narrow categories. But the point I want to make here as well is that often people think about using machine learning as uh, something that will kind of automate or do everything for a particular task. I think it can often be useful to actually just see it as one step that might make one part of a workflow or process much easier and kind of uh, enable you to kind of speed things up without actually doing all of the steps. So with a thing um, like this use case, you might sort documents into two categories. And um, one is basically I'm somehow interested in reading more about this document or kind of looking at this document further and other ones that you don't want to look at for some reason. And with the ones that you do want to look at further, you might then manually go in and still do a bunch of other things. But even that process of removing the redundant documents can be quite helpful uh, and something where machine learning could, could kind of help you speed up your work. And similarly, um, assigning specific metadata might be something where using a kind of more simple approach like text classification could give you a little bit more control on the possible labels and will also be much cheaper uh, to run. And there's a bunch of other non-generative uses of machine learning that I think are very useful in a library setting. So one of these is similarity search. So this can be similarity based on uh, documents. So you have one document and you wanna find more similar documents. So that's already something that's built into a lot of kind of systems that we might use in libraries, but it's also something that's actually, uh, you know, something you can build yourself for a particular collection. Similar to the text classification, image classification models can be very useful for um, either processing image collections or assigning some labels or just helping you in some kind of workflow where you're working with lots of images. Text to image search is kind of similar in a way to the similarity search, but allows users or staff members to use text to find relevant images. And entity recognition, where you have a document and you want to extract some kind of key entities, so locations, people, places, things like that. And I guess all of these types of machine learning approaches have been around for a long time, but are probably getting slightly less loved than they used to because everyone's so excited about generative AI. Well, actually, these models have been getting much better and the kind of work involved in using or training or deploying these models has got much uh, less. So it's actually quite a, a practical thing to, to use in practice in many cases. So I guess that turns to my next question of how would you actually use some of these other approaches? So I'm going to talk about a few different ways, and I'm going to do that through the kind of general rubric of using open source. And there's three main points uh, or three main approaches to leveraging these kind of open approaches to machine learning. So one is to use existing tools, one is to use existing models, and one is to adapt existing models. And I guess these are slightly going down from fairly accessible to a little bit more involved, but potentially something that could be worthwhile doing if you have a, a kind of use case that, that warrants the effort. But before I kind of go on to that, I think it's useful just to have a look at how good open source models are in general. And I'm kind of cheating here a little bit because here I'm showing examples of um, large language models. So not these kind of task specific models. But the kind of point is similar and in a way with the task specific models, open source models often do better than the closed ones already. But even with um, large language models and generative AI models, what this chart is showing um, is over time, the kind of performance of both the proprietary in purple and the open models in green uh, 
And you can see that kind of there was a very large gap, um, not even that long ago, just over a year. Um, and if you go to today, the, the gap is shrinking quite a lot. Um, so I think in the next year or something, this gap will kind of continue to close more and more. And there's probably going to be an up and down. But at least in general, these open models can already be very useful, even without any fine tuning. And this is another example here of a model that Google just released. And this is a model that you could run on you know, a relatively good laptop, but on a laptop uh, locally. And that model is about as good as the kind of GPT-4 that was released uh, a year or a year and a bit ago. So what is possible to do in open source and also what is possible to actually run on very kind of modest hardware is um, yeah, getting quite impressive, I would say. So the other thing I want to mention before kind of diving into some of these tools um, is going back to the Hugging Face Hub, which underpins a lot of these approaches. And as I already mentioned, the Hugging Face Hub is a place where people can share models, data sets and spaces. And these numbers are horribly out of date now, but you can see uh, the kind of scale of models and data sets that are shared on the, on the Hugging Face Hub. And some of these models are kind of very general models and some are very specific to a particular use case. So I can show some of those uh, shortly. And this space is, um, is a kind of place in which people can showcase uh, machine learning models. So they can be very simple demos, but you also have people hosting more complex applications here. And I think these spaces can actually be very useful for libraries to build tools that can be useful for themselves, but also other libraries without having to deal with this issue of, okay, where am I gonna deploy this? And am I gonna have to install this locally and have IT kind of set up all this stuff for me that they're probably not gonna be very enthusiastic about setting up. So going to the first way in which you can leverage open source is uh, using these ex existing tools. Um, and I put three here, which are kind of very library focused. So this first one is for extracting information from scholarly documents. So if you upload a kind of PDF of an article, it will extract some kind of key information like citations um, that you might be interested in. Another one in a kind of slightly similar vein is something called AS Review. And this is a kind of tool for helping you do systematic reviews. And basically the approach you take to that is that you kind of can upload a bunch of documents that you think might be useful for a systematic review. And this tool will kind of go through them and get you to rate whether a particular one is useful or not. And what that tool is doing under the hood is training a kind of small uh, machine learning model to kind of get better at understanding what it is that you're after. And all of those models that it's using underneath are kind of open source models, which are you know fairly small, but for this particular task, particularly because you're giving it some additional training in the process of doing those ratings, uh, works very well. And then finally, there's this tool called ANIF, which is from the Finnish National Library. Uh, and this is a tool for doing automated subject indexing. Um, so I'm kind of optimistic that we'll see more tools like this being developed by and for libraries that allow people to use some of these open source models without having to kind of write code themselves. Um, and I think that's something where potentially the library sector could kind of work together to kind of facilitate more of those tools being developed. There's also other existing tools which might not be developed for libraries particularly, but can be very useful in a library setting. So one of these um, is a tool that allows you to uh, run a model called Whisper. So some of you may have come across this model, but it's a model from OpenAI that does speech to uh, text uh, transcription. And if you have kind of audio collections that aren't transcribed, then even having a kind of fairly rough uh, transcription can be quite a powerful way of getting a better sense of what's in those collections and making them more discoverable. And there's a lot of open source models, including this Whisper model that allow you to do this, and a bunch of different tools that allow you to run these models without having to write any code. But underneath, 
basically they're running one of these open um, models and it's actually becoming easier and easier to also improve those models for your own uh, use case or language. So kind of looking a little bit more at using existing models, this is a screenshot of the Hugging Face Hub and it's showing the kind of model landing page. So you can see there's a bunch of different models here. And on the left, we have um, a bunch of kind of filters you can use to try and find a model that might be more suited for a particular task. So you have all of these tasks that are kind of um, different tasks in machine learning. And I guess this can be one of the tricky things when you're first starting out on this topic is understanding what all of these different things mean, but you have things like image classification or translation models. And basically these filters will help you find a model for that particular use case. Um, but alongside that, you can also filter by other properties. So if you're working with data in a particular language or you're interested in models of a particular license, you can also filter on those facets. And turning to look at uh, an actual model. So this is um, the page for a model hosted on the Hugging Face Hub. And what you see here is something called a model card. Um, and I think this is a really important concept that was developed a couple of years ago. And it was kind of in the pre-generative AI hype phase. Um, but the idea of a model card is to provide some kind of documentation that is fairly systematic about what a model does, what it's good for, what the limitations are, what biases it might have. And the idea is to give people who are going to use these models a better sense of where it might work well and where it's not going to work well. And uh, creating these model cards is something that kind of encouraged very strongly on the Hugging Face Hub. Um, and in this particular case, we have a model that is focused on uh, classifying cultural heritage metadata. In this case, Italian cultural heritage metadata. So basically, with a bit of metadata, you uh, get a rating for this low quality or high quality. And you can see actually this uh, thing called the uh, inference widget which basically uh, allows you on a lot of models hosted on the hub, a Hugging Face Hub to kind of try out the model directly on the web page without having to set anything up locally. And that can be very useful for giving you a sense of whether this model is going to be useful for you or not. Um, so I guess that's a, a kind of fairly lucky scenario if you're interested in classifying cultural heritage metadata accuracy for Italian cultural heritage metadata records to find a model that does that. Um, so I guess if people share more of these models, then you will get more cases where that will be uh, possible. But a lot of the times you might want to adapt an existing model if you have a kind of more specific task where uh, you don't find a model that already does the thing you're interested in. Um, and what this screen is showing is one example of doing that for um, object detection. So what you can see on the left here it's the inference widget for this model from Facebook called Data ResNet 50. Um, and basically what this model is trained to do is to find objects and images. So in this case, you can see it's finding buses and planes and people and trucks. Um, so if you wanna find those things in images, then okay, that model's quite useful, but often you don't wanna find uh, things like that. You might have a slightly different use case in mind. But because this model is open and it already knows, um, in air quotes, quite a lot about how to find things in images, you can use a process known as fine tuning to adapt that model to a more uh, suitable task. So in this case, what you have here is a uh, model that's been trained to identify illustrations in these historic chat books from the National Library of Scotland. And that model was trained using this model as a starting point and what that means is that you need a lot less data to actually train that model because it's already quite good at doing this task of finding things in images in general. And you can more quickly get to a model that does something quite well for your particular use case. So you can see here that it's doing a pretty good job of finding those. The other kind of approach that is becoming um, more prominent is these models that allow you to do slightly more task specific things than a generative model but without actually having to train the model uh, to do that. So here we have an example that does named entity recognition, which I mentioned earlier. So it's picking out things like organization and location. 
Those are fairly standard categories for many named entity recognition models to have because it's something that a lot of people are interested in. But what this particular model allows you to do is to also add the uh, labels that you're interested in. So in this particular case, I've also added the category of collections. So you can see here, maybe this is not a super good example because it's a cultural heritage collection. I don't know if that's a collection itself, but it's also managed to pick out uh, this example here. So these kind of models can be quite powerful because they're very easy to run and much less computationally expensive. They still give you some control over the labels you choose um, and potentially they you know, work well enough or if they don't work well enough, then it can be a very useful starting point for creating your own training data to adapt uh, a new model for that particular task. So I'm kind of running out of my self-imposed time limits, but I'm going to quickly go through this question of how to leverage generative AI effectively, because I think, although I've kind of pushed a lot for these other approaches, I think a lot of people will still be interested in using generative AI. And I think there are a lot of use cases where it can be very useful. But I think there's some ways in which libraries could be um, a little bit more careful about how they assess these models and how well they're working. And there's different ways in which you can do this, but I think if you're going to use one of these models for things that are kind of, I guess, outside of tasks like helping you write an email or summarize an email or, you know, kind of day-to-day -day business office tasks that, you know, we probably do on an ad hoc basis, but aren't repeating over and over. If we want to use one of these large language models for something a little bit more uh, systematic, where we might be kind of using these models on a regular basis, then I think it is worth doing this extra work of comparing models and trying to evaluate how well they're performing. And I think the first thing to do with that is to think about what it is you're trying to achieve. So this goes a little bit back to the idea of how to incorporate machine learning models into a particular workflow. You have to think a little bit about what is the actual outcome we're trying to achieve and what part is a machine learning model or a generative model playing in that? And then the second question, which can be hard to do, but is there a way in which we can measure how well a model is doing at that particular task? And then we can think about comparing different models. So I think you can do things like prompt engineering to try and improve the performance of a particular model, but you might also want to compare across different models to see if one who's doing a lot better and that could be open source or closed source models that um, you're comparing so there's a few ways in which you can kind of just jump to this comparing models that is uh, kind of being done by the community so there's a bunch of different leaderboards that people have created to help evaluate both open and closed source models so i've given two examples here and what these leaderboards basically try and do is assess uh LLMs across a bunch of different tasks. So some of those tasks will be um, very focused on things like reasoning or coding. Uh, other times it'll be on more creative tasks and try and then give some scores to the models for those particular tasks. And then often they'll give you an overview uh, of the kind of aggregate score and let you drill down. And pointing out here in this particular leaderboard, I think I took this screenshot today, you can see the first eight uh, results are all kind of closed models, but then number nine and 10 are both open models. So you can see that even in these leaderboards, they're doing um, pretty well. Um, this leaderboard takes a slightly different approach. Instead of um, assessing the models on a benchmark data set, what it does is it uh, allows people, and that could include you, to basically chat to these models and you will get back two responses and you say which of those you prefer. And using that, it kind of builds this leaderboard of which models people prefer. Um, the caveat I would give with all of these is that they are basing these scores on a very specific set of tasks. And even with this kind of chat interface, the fact that people like the models to chat to doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be useful for another task. So you have to take these leaderboards with a grain of salt, but they can be quite a useful way of getting a sense of which models uh, work well. Um, but going back to this question of what you're trying to achieve. So this is a very kind of um, kind of made up fictional use case, but basically I wanted to do an example of how you might assess these large language models in a slightly more systematic way with the question of how uh, well they do at helping you create PubMed advanced search queries. 
So probably most of you are familiar with PubMed, but you have this ability to do these advanced queries where you're using controlled vocabulary to kind of get back better results from your search. And you can do something like this, which I found that um, a lot of people are kind of using this kind of approach to help them start generating a search query. So they might not use it for the whole process, but as a starting point, this can be quite a useful time saver. So you might have a prompt like this, which is basically saying, you know, here's a topic I'm interested in. Please like only uh, involve, only have articles involve human participants, use mesh headings, and then you assign some kind of filter. And then you get back this um, kind of advanced search query. And the nice thing about that advanced search query is that you can kind of directly paste it into the PubMed URL and see how many results you kind of get back. So what I was able to do um, is basically compare across a few made up prompts. So I think I did uh, nine different ones and then ask a bunch of these different models to generate the search queries and then see how many results you get back. So you can see there's quite a wide range. So some don't actually result in um, a query that will be accepted by PubMed. So they might put in kind of invalid uh, syntax or something like that. Um, others return a lot of results, which probably isn't good because it suggests the query has been very broad and others uh, kind of fall more in a kind of narrow range. So it's a little bit hard to directly say that more uh, results in this case is better or less results is better, but it gives you some sense of um, how these models are doing this particular task. Um, so you can see here the kind of also the actual results that they come back with. So this is um, the results from the anthropic model, Claude, uh, and comparing that to a kind of open source models results. Um, and in this case, you can see this quoted phrase is not found means that there's one mesh heading in there that isn't recognized. So that's where the kind of model has hallucinated that something's a mesh heading that doesn't actually exist. So this is, again, a little bit of a made up use case, but I think there can be use cases where you can kind of crowbar some kind of approach like this um, to help you evaluate models in a slightly more systematic way. And you can do that you know, by writing a code script, but you could also just manually run some queries and then fill out a spreadsheet with the results and kind of try and get a little bit more of a quantitative sense of uh, how well the models are performing and where they might uh, not work well. So I'm gonna very quickly go through this section about contributing to open source machine learning to try and leave some time for questions. So I guess the first thing to say is that this do-it-yourself approach is probably daunting for a lot of institutions, um, but I think there is this other approach that the library sector can work on, which is doing it together. Um, so there's some examples of this kind of approach out there already. Um, so one is this initiative I was involved in called Big Lam, which was an effort to get machine learning data sets from libraries and archives shared on the Hugging Face Hub in a kind of accessible format. And what that kind of allows people to do is then to find data sets that can help train models for these more library specific tasks. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity in the library sector to do more of that kind of work and potentially develop data sets together. Um, there's also AI for LAM, which many of you will be familiar with, which is a community which is sharing kind of best practices and ideas about how to leverage AI in the library sector. And a kind of more recent effort that I was involved in around um, generating data sets together. So this was a um, community effort to kind of build new data sets. And it had a particular focus on building new data sets for languages that aren't well represented. And the approach we took is to kind of set up this interface where you could crowdsource annotations from the community. So I think this is something that libraries already do quite a lot of, but I think there could be more scope for saying, hey, there's a task that, that a lot of libraries want to do, but there's no machine learning model for that task, partly because there's no data for training that model. And I think the library sector could get together and create that data set. Um, and it could be something that's quite practical to actually do fairly quickly and uh, fairly easily. And the final kind of aspect of this sharing is that I think 
in the UK at least there's these um, open access policies but I think these are also quite prominent in a lot of countries now that when people are funded to do research by some kind of government funding body they're expected to share the outputs of that and I think so far there hasn't been that much deliberate attention played to machine learning models but I think there is a big argument to be made that actually sharing those machine learning models that result from funded research should also be made publicly available. So this is a kind of very exaggerated example of how much uh, one of these models costs to train. And this is unlikely to be the case for many models in academia. But it could still be the case that one of these models that is trained to do something maybe very specialized in a kind of biology use case or uh, humanities use case could still cost, you know, a thousand, ten thousand uh, pounds or dollars to train. And there's a big argument to be made for kind of making that work available for others to kind of build on top of. So there's actually some kind of nice examples of universities um, and also archives sharing models and data sets on the Hugging Face Hub and contributing to that ecosystem. I guess I'll skip over this very quickly, but I think there is also this point I wanted just to make that I think the library sector should be uh, quite prominent in interjecting its voice into uh, the development of machine learning. So I think the, there's a lot of discussion about how to use machine learning responsibly, you know, what the potential limitations are. And I think there's three areas in particular where libraries can have a strong input uh, in that discussion. So one is about this question of how you document machine learning artifacts or how you kind of describe these machine learning models and data sets. There's also this point around increasing the diversity of the training data that's used to train these models. So libraries hold interesting collections that potentially could make these models more diverse, both in terms of language, but also the kind of content that the models are trained on. And then this one, which I think a lot of libraries are already starting to grapple with is information literacy. So how to kind of teach students and other users how to kind of think and about and use these uh, AI models. Okay, so I'll stop there. I've gone a little bit over time, but I think we should have a little bit of time for questions and discussion. Thanks very much, Daniel. So there have been a number of questions which have come in. Um, if you stop sharing, we can go to full screen. There we go. Um, so we've got we've got a few minutes for some questions. And yeah, I, I think I would definitely echo your, your comments about kind of doing it together and that kind of role for kind of role for libraries. I think that's really kind of really exciting and really something for us to engage on. Um, one of the early questions is actually much more about your your career itself so i wonder actually uh there was a question about how you made the transition into a machine learning role uh mm -hmm. the the um the the person asking the questions a librarian who's planning on doing a data science masters um but really loves librarianship as a profession so working on that role which and i think to some extent you probably started to touch on that in your closing section as well there you know looking at the different ways in which libraries can contribute to that um but I wonder if you could say a little bit about that transition that you've made. Yeah, so I mean, I kind of um, had always been quite interested in digital scholarship and how libraries could leverage technology in their work. So as part of that, I kind of learned to, to kind of code. Um, and then I think it was in my role during Living Machines that I kind of got a lot more hands on with actually training machine learning models. And I think that was quite a fortunate position because I had the, the opportunity to do that. Um, I think in terms of more librarians getting into this space, I think there's a, the, I mean, I, I don't always feel very capable of giving career advice, but I think there are a few things that are probably important. I think one is sharing openly what you're working on. I think that's something that's really valued in the machine learning world, um, or at least parts of it is sharing kind of blog posts and documenting what you're doing. I think that's a, a really kind of valued part of the, the ecosystem. And I think the, the kind of point maybe I made a little bit towards the end is about um, yeah, librarians having to be quite forceful, I guess, in communicating what uh, skills and kind of ideas that they can bring to the space. So I think that's something that 
can be a little bit difficult, but I think there is a kind of need to interject. And actually with the, the role I have at Hugging Face, I think I'm quite fortunate because Hugging Face um, kind of saw the opportunity in having someone with a library background working at Hugging Face. But I think there are other organizations um, working in the machine learning space that probably would be similarly open-minded. So I think it's finding the right um, organizations. And then I guess just presenting the skills you have from library work in a way that kind of resonates with people who might not quite understand what libraries do, but understand the skills when you explain it in that way. Yeah, no, that, that that's great. And I think that's, you know, I think your talk today is incredibly inspiring. And I think looking at the way in which you can make that transition. Um, so we've got a couple of questions about the sort of kind of hub itself. Um, um, so one about kind of, how Hugging Face kind of monitors or manages the quality of the L the LLMs which are mm -hmm. are on the platform. Yeah, so, so yeah, there's a few ways in which we do that. So I mentioned a few of the leaderboards, but we also have our own called the Open LLM Leaderboard, and this is a way in which community people training models, and that could be companies or individuals training, uh, in this case, large language models can submit their model to be evaluated um, on this leaderboard. And then it kind of gives you some scores across common metrics. I guess alongside that more um, kind of formal um, validation of how well models work, there's uh, something on the Hug and Face Hub for discussion. So models will have a kind of discussions tab where often people will discuss, you know, where a model works well or where a model doesn't work well. So I think the, the kind of idea of evaluating models is still very much in development, but I think there's the kind of quantitative and qualitative approaches, which are both kind of, yeah, taking place uh, on the Hub. Yeah, and I think that ties up to as there was a, a sort of follow up question from a, another commenter about kind of knowing how these models were trained and any kind of validation made for them and evaluating their production, which I think kind of ties into that. Um, so with the, the there was a question as well about the removal of documents as relevant to sort of some of the systems. So I guess thinking mm -hmm. about the ways in which um, they're they're trained. Uh, so the question was, in terms of the removal of documents as relevant to the systems, um, how does how do the, some of these models learn not to eliminate relevant documents? <laughs> yeah, so I'm not sure if this is in relation to the example I had for I the text classification. I think it will be. Yeah, so in that case, the way they learn is just by the examples you give them. So what you mean by relevant is kind of... Um, yeah, up to you. And then with a bit of luck, the model should be able to capture um, what it is that kind of makes a, a particular document relevant or not. Um, the nice thing, though, about these text classification models, these more simple models, is you have like standard metrics you can use to measure the performance of those models. So the way you normally do that is you have some training data, some validation data, and then some test data. And this test data you're kind of supposed to use at the end of having trained the model and you will then get some kind of score across some metrics so accuracy is a kind of common one that people will use and that will give you a sense of how often is the model wrong in its prediction and even if a model is wrong sometimes it can still be useful but knowing you know how often it's wrong can give you a bit of a better sense of yeah. how to actually use it in practice no that's fantastic so we've got just two more two more questions before we wind up one uh, a more specific one tying back to your your PubMed example, and that was really interesting seeing how you could use it to build kind of build searches. Uh, was in the PubMed example, uh, would you be using long Lang Chain or do you use a different framework? And I don't know what Lang Chain is. Yeah, so um, I didn't for that particular use case, and that's definitely something you could do. So I just um did this via um the APIs directly, but okay um. Yeah, I think that that's a that would also be a valid approach to to using uh, that kind of approach. Okay, fantastic. And the last question was really kind of kind of quite broadly. Uh, is do you think there's a bit of a learning curve for open source AI tools? And I guess that's probably particularly for librarians. Bearing in mind, you know, where you're 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 suggesting that we we get into. But I wonder if you had a kind of 
final final thought or comments around that that learning curve for us as librarians and AI yeah and i think open there source is ai tools yeah i think there is for some of them i would say for others there's very little learning curve so there's something called hugging chat so if you go to huggingface.co forward slash chat you have an interface that's very similar to the open ai or claude one where you can try some of these open language models and that's free to use. So if you just want to try out one of these open models and see, okay, how does that do compared to a closed model, then that is very kind of straightforward. There are also increasingly tools for something which I will not talk that much about, um, but the idea of local LLM, so wanting to run the LLM on your own hardware. And I think there's a there's various different software you can use, but there's one called LM Studio, and that's basically an application where you can load a model and chat to it and upload documents that you want to kind of use as context for that model. And that is very simple to kind of use. And I think the barrier to, to using those kind of tools is reducing um, quite rapidly. I think for the other parts like training models, I think the barriers to doing that is also coming down, but I uh, acknowledge that there is still some somewhat of a learning curve in some of the language and kind of, um, yeah, some of the concepts you have to learn can be a little bit tricky at first. There's a lot of assumed knowledge sometimes, even on a kind of model card, you might have all of these terms you've never come across before uh, mentioned. But I think over time, that has got better and hopefully will continue to get better. Um, yeah, make that learning curve a little bit smoother. Well, thanks very much. And I think.